how good it is to be back at Pine Grove. Uh, it's been a little while since I've been here. Uh, I got to looking back at some of the old records that I keep, and uh, I've preached revival here three times. One time with Boyd Reed, one time with John Henley, and one time with Ken Fox. So that's a lot of years ago, and it's certainly good to, to be back at Pine Grove. Uh, it took a long time for y'all to get over the last time I was here. <laughs> uh, but it's certainly good to be back. Uh, let me invite you to take your Bibles and uh, turn with me to Psalm number 85. Uh, I thought that it was rather unique that one of the verses of Scripture that I'll use today is in your bulletin. And uh, I want us to talk about revival just a little bit. I, I, I believe that uh, there is a great misconception about what true God-sent revival really is. And it's something that's needed in our land today. Notice, if you will, verse 6 and then verse 7. The Bible says here, Wilt thou not revive us again? that thy people may rejoice in thee. And then verse 7 says, Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Let's pray together. Father, we surely thank you for the reading of your precious word. And uh, for just a moment, Lord, uh, today we certainly want to Think about being revived. The psalmist said to here, revive us again. And Lord, if there's ever been a time that we need revival in the church of the living God, it's uh, the day wherein we live. Now Lord, I must first confess to you that uh, I'm a very weak man. Lord, uh, I'm a man that needs you. For without you, I cannot speak any words of wisdom. But relying upon the Holy Spirit of God and relying upon your power and your might, words of wisdom can not only be said, but Lord, we'll leave this place having been refreshed, renewed, and uh, we'll leave this place being able to make a difference in our world. Use this, I pray now, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, as I begin to think about these couple of verses of Scripture, first and foremost, I want you to know that David was the author of many of the Psalms. In fact, David wrote most of the Psalms that we read in the Bible's songbook. But you need to understand that there are several authors that are not mentioned by name, and this particular Psalm is one of those uh, that doesn't really have what we consider an author. Uh, it is written by some unknown individual that had much to say to us in this particular psalm, especially in the two verses that I read to you in your hearing. Now, uh, whenever I begin to think about uh, revival, there's a question that comes to mind. What is the real source of of our problems today. You know, one of the things that it's so easy for us to do is to see everybody else's problems. And many times we don't ever see our own problems. We always see what everybody else is doing, but we don't ever see what we're doing or what we're not doing. And uh, so that's why I say that we need revival. Now many would say, well, preacher, we need revival because... There's so much crime in our country today. Well, while that may be true, that's not really the reason I believe that we need revival. And then somebody else might say, well, preacher, we need revival because there's so many gangs and so many drugs and so much drug addiction in our communities. Well, while that may be true, my friend, I don't believe that that's why we really need revival. And then... Uh, some may say that uh, 
Well, there's just other reasons. I mean, you may come up with something else. Listen to me for just a moment. I believe with all of my heart to the reason that we need a God-sent revival is simply because, listen, the church of the living God is in a lethargic stage. I believe that. I, I believe that the devil has just about rocked the church of the living God to sleep. And the church of the living God finds itself in a very comatose uh, uh, state. Now, as believers, uh, uh, we have, my friend, uh, a service problem. We have a service problem. Now, to formulate true God-sent revival, God has given to us the formula that we need to follow. Uh, I, I believe that as the church goes, so goes the nation. Now, I believe that. When the church was on fire for the living God, you saw great things happening in the nation. But now that it seems that the church is in a lethargic state, comatose, wrapped up in entertainment and pleasure, rather than truly serving the living God, we see all of that bleeding over out into our country today. Nobody can ever be satisfied what anybody else is doing. Now, it's an easy thing to say, well, you got the liberals who believe this, and you got the conservatives who believe that. I just believe what the Word of God says. Amen? Uh, and, and I'm not going to jump on that ship, but the formula to true God-sent revival is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, where the Bible says, listen to what it says, if my people, that's not talking about the people that's not his, if my people who are called by my name, first of all it says we need to do something, we need to humble ourselves. One of the greatest gifts that God can give to any of us is a spirit of humility. A spirit of humility. I hate to say this, but not very many people possess the spirit of humility anymore. In fact, uh, I believe that uh, if somebody wrongs us, we see how quick we can get them back. Amen? I mean, really. If my people who will call by my name, will humble themselves. And then it says that we need to pray. I like to think that I'm a praying man. I try to pray every day. And the Bible says that we need to pray without ceasing. And somebody asked me one time, says, Preacher, how do you pray without ceasing? Does that mean that I need to walk around and pray all day long? And I said, just as sure as I'm standing here, if God lays a prayer on your heart, you stop and you talk to Him. God wants us to communicate with Him. Uh, the biggest problem that I see that we have as a church and as a people is the biggest prayers that we ever pray is for God to give us something. We always want God to give us something. I saw a cute little... Uh, uh, I, I love funny papers and, and that kind of... You know, the Bible says a merry heart doeth good like medicine. And I'm kind of a character, and I enjoy a laughter. And, and uh, one of the ladies came up to me a few minutes ago and said, Last time I saw you, you was doing Jerry Climber. <laughs> and I said, Well, I don't do that very much anymore. Uh, but, but I can do that. But, but I enjoy a good laugh. And uh, laughter is important. I saw a good little funny the other day, and that little funny had a sign that had fallen down on a man and up above it, the prayer was, Lord, give me a sign. And the Lord just pushed the sign over on the individual. He gave them a sign. But we need to pray. We need to communicate with God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray. And then the next thing that scripture says, it says, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. You see, there's some things that you and I, we've got to do. We've got to do all of these things that God says in that scripture. And when we do that, the Bible teaches me that God will hear our prayer and that he will heal our land. That 
that's the fix for our nation today. Uh, those things that we need to do as God's people. Well, whenever I begin to think about revival, what is revival? Well, revival is something that we love to call ourselves having. And most of times, whenever we have a revival, the first thing out of somebody's mouth is how many people got saved at the revival. I got news for you. Not always do people get saved at the revival. Many times it's after the series of meetings, if the church is awakened, that revival begins to come. Now, a little over a year ago, God sent me to Fellowship Baptist Church, and uh, I preached the series of meetings there, and uh, the church just really exploded as far as what revival really is. The altars filled up and people began to pray. We saw tears. And friends, let me tell you something. They've been in revival ever since. I can't remember how many souls that they baptized since that series of meetings. So revival is not evangelism, even though I like evangelism. Sometimes I, I like to think that I'm an evangelical preacher, an evangelist, but... Uh, I had one fellow to tell me in my life that I was too evangelical. How do you get to be too evangelical? Whenever you want to see people saved by the grace of God. Uh, but revival is not evangelism, even though people may get saved because of revival. Now, I'm an emotional person. I'll cry I, at the drop of a hat, okay? I'm a very emotional person. Didn't take much for me to cry. Whenever I was doing chaplaincy with the hospice, man, I was sitting on the bedside with many families and tears running down my face with them, crying with them because they were hurt and they were going through so much. But ev evangelism and emotionalism, that's, although they may be important, that's not revival. You see, revival... What it is, is a renewal of spiritual life. A renewal of spiritual life in an individual or a group of people. Now let me ask you something. How many of you remember how excited you were when you first got saved? Man, you wanted everybody to have a taste of what you had experienced. You wanted everybody to experience the salvation that you had experienced and so you shared that thought with everybody and you soon found out that everybody didn't want to taste what you had experienced but that shouldn't have stopped you <coughs> revival is a renewal bringing us back to a place that we once were maybe God wants to bring us back to the place that we were when we first got saved by the grace of God. Now don't misunderstand what I'm about to say because I believe that once God saves you, that you're saved for an eternity. I believe that. I believe that you're saved for eternity. But while you may be saved for an eternity, you need to understand that you just don't stay as close to God as you ought to be. You see, it's an easy thing to kind of wander off. The devil likes to make us lethargic Christians. He likes to bring us to a comatose state. He likes to rock us to sleep. And when we find ourselves in that state, when we find ourselves, my friend, with our hearts in that mood, when we seem to be farther away from God than we want to be, it's not God that's moved, it's us. And when that happens, that's when we need revival. Well, when is it needed? Well, let's look at that for just a moment. Whenever the love of God's people has waxed cold. I've never in my life uh, seen the love of God's people waxing as cold as it is in this modern time. When I was ordained as a gospel preacher over 35, about 34 or 5 years ago, uh, my pastor that ordained me, John Gibbs Sr., he looked at me and he said, I feel sorry for you, son. And I said, Brother John, why would you feel sorry for me? 
He said, because you're going to see some things happen in the church like you wouldn't believe. He didn't know that he was giving to me a prophetic word, but you know what? He told me the truth. The last funeral I had with Chess Smith before he went to meet the Lord, who was pastor of the First Baptist Church of Tifton for so long, he looked at me and he said, Brother Danny, he said, I'm so grateful and thankful that you got in just to see a little bit about what church was really like before things began to change. Listen, consider the symptoms of the need of revival. There are several. Number one, complacency. Whenever we find ourselves satisfied with the status quo, uh, Greg Love is a friend of mine, and Greg sent me a message this morning, and uh, he sent a scripture, and the scripture basically dealt with what do you think uh, is uh, keeping us from being where we ought to be with God? And, of course, my answer to Greg was self. You see, we reach a place of self-satisfaction. And when we reach that place, it's then that we need revival. Secondly, we need revival when there's a lack of concern for the lost. Now, it's sad to me that, that, that there's a discussion going on now in many of our churches. Well, God knows everything. He knows who we'll be saved to. Well, well that may be true. God knows the elect. I believe that. The Bible says that he knows the elect. I believe that he knows the elect. But let me tell you something. I don't have a list of the elect. And until I get a list of the elect, I'm going to be a whosoever will may come and take of the water of life free. That's what I believe. Now, I realize that God knows it all. But he's not willing that any man perish but that all men come to repentance. Now think about this with me for just a moment. Suppose no one ever had shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Where would you be? You'd be lost and without a Savior. But there's a lack of concern for the lost. We need revival. Whenever we're har harboring or hiding secret sin, any of you good folk got any secret sins in your life? Anybody? Let me tell you something. You may be able to hide your secret sins from Brother Gerald. I don't know how many deacons you have here now, but you may be able to hide your secret sins from your deacon. My goodness, your deacons may even have some secret sins. You may be able to hide your secret <coughs> sins from your Sunday school teacher. You may be able to hide your secret sins from any human being, but you can't hide your secret sins from God. Amen. He sees you for what you really are. And when we have secret sins in our lives, we need revival. Whenever there's any animosity toward other Christians, are there Christian brothers and sisters in the faith that you got problems with? Think about that for just a moment. I think there are those that we've all had problems with because we're all human beings. And all of us don't like the same thing. But whenever there's animosity toward a brother or sister in the faith, then you need to work on that. You need revival. Uh, whenever you have an unforgiving spirit, you need revival. Uh, the Bible says, and the Lord says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Did you hear what he said? If we can't forgive those who trespass against us, then we won't be forgiven by God. Amen. Whenever we're so full of self and pride, it's an easy thing to be prideful. But you know what the Bible says about pride? The Bible says pride comes before the fall. Uh, I've experienced that in my ministry and in my life. I've been so wrapped up in myself and so prideful that God couldn't do anything except let me fall. And if you'll admit this this morning, you probably found yourself there too. And it's usually during the time of the fall that you realize that you need revival. 
You need a, a renewal, uh, being filled with pride. Any condition of spiritual standing where you find yourself less than where you were with God, you find yourself in a backslidden state. Now, there are dangers in our need for revival. What are the dangers, preacher? Well, first of all, usually, usually deterioration comes and we don't even know it. I got a sermon that I preach and I, I don't know where it is. I, I got it filed away somewhere. Uh, when I married uh, Miss Marta, I wasn't a very good organizer. I had all my sermon outlines from over the years. I had them just thrown in a box. And uh, she said, oh, no, we can't have that. <laughs> and so she went and uh, she bought me a filing cabinet. And she helped me file my outlines from Genesis to Revelation. Now, I've been doing this a long time. Do you know that there's... I found out after we did that that there was a few books in the Bible that I never preached a sermon from. Can you believe that? But uh, there's a sermon I've got in those outlines somewhere, and the title of it is, Are You Drifting? Do you realize that we can be drifting and not even realize it? The story's told of two old boys that like to go fishing, and... and uh, they just got to drifting toward the waterfall, but they were catching so many fish till, till they didn't even notice the waterfall until it was just about too late. Well, friends, that's the way the devil works. He'll cause you to drift so far away from God that you won't even know you're away from God until you're about to go over the waterfall. Samson had the power of God all over him, but yet he played around with sin and he was found wanting. Uh, the disciples had received power from the Lord Jesus Christ, but they didn't have the power to cast out demons. Uh, they lost their power. They were unaware that it was gone. And Jesus told them it was because of their unbelief. Unbelief is real. Often the conditions of our heart is in such a way that we're not even aware that we're in need even in the time of our need. Friends, we need revival. Flesh fights against revival. And for us to have the revival that I want to see us have these next few days, we're going to have to realize that we need it. Well, now, what kind of revival do we need? I believe that we need a revival that will resurrect this church. Wait a minute, preacher. Are you saying our church is dead? No, I didn't. Well, you said it needed resurrecting. Well, it might be that some of us in this building has been rocked to sleep. And it's time to wake up. Do you realize that if God were to wake up the church of the living God, that sleeping giant would make a difference in our world? This church needs to be resurrected. But listen to me. Every church needs to be resurrected. Well, church I serve over in Adel, it needs to be resurrected. Uh, churches everywhere need to be resurrected. And as the church begins to be resurrected, you'll see our nation begin to be resurrected. Amen. Now, revival means to return to life. Jesus declared to the church at Sardis, He said, Thou hast a name that thou livest. But thou art dead. Jesus said to the church of Laodicea, He said, You think that you're rich, but you're poor, you're naked, and you're blind. He rebuked the church of Ephesus for having left their first love. And elements of all seven churches of Asia are present in our modern day churches today. Now listen to me. Some folks are members of this church in name only. Did you hear what I said? Some folks are members of this church in name only. I was the associate pastor of First Baptist Church Nashville for, I guess, two years. 
And then I was their interim pastor for 15 months while they searched for a pastor. And we pulled the church roll out. And do you know that we had over 3,500 members on the roll of our church? 3,500. The FBI couldn't find some of them. <laughs> but nobody wanted to purge the roll. Oh, we got to say that we got all these members. There's some folk probably that you've got as members of your church that, uh, that you never see. The FBI couldn't find them. But now listen to me. I'm not saying that we need to purge anybody and just kind of throw them to one side, but they, there's a, such a thing as an inactive list. And, and uh, I suggested that. But now, now hear me. There, there are some folks that just cannot be found. Uh, they're members in name only. But now when something happens, listen, when something happens, and something will happen eventually, if Jesus tarries his coming, something's going to happen in your family. I don't know when, I don't know where, don't know how it may happen. December the 3rd of last year, Mama Preta was sitting in church at Gordon Avenue Baptist Church. After the message was over and we got in the car and we started home, she looked at me and she said, Bonnie, that was the best sermon you've ever preached. I don't know about all the other preaching I've done to her over the years, but she liked that one better than anything. I don't even remember what I preached that morning. But by 2 o'clock the next morning, she was with the Lord. Something is going to happen. And I'll guarantee you, when that something happens, people that you haven't saw in years will say, well, I'm a member of Pine Grove Baptist Church because we all like to think that we belong somewhere. And don't misunderstand me whenever I say this. I'm a proud member of Gordon Avenue Baptist Church where I pastor. I'm a proud member of that church. But I'm a great a gracefully great member of the church of the living God. Amen. And I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, I, I get in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it, okay? It might be 20 more years before I get to come back. <laughs> Some folk are more proud to be a Baptist than they are to be saved. And don't misunderstand yeah. me when I say that. I'm proud to be a Baptist. Been a Baptist all my life. But I'd rather be saved than to be a Baptist. Yeah. Now, with that being said, there are other people who are just satisfied with things the way they are. And you know, I pastored the church one time, and I had the chairman of deacons come to me and say, Now, preacher, you need to behave yourself. You're bringing too many people into our church, and we're losing control of our little church. Satisfied with the status quo, we need revival. Still others are too concerned about their own agendas to see that we need revival. What we need to do, church, is cry out to God like this psalmist did. Revive us again. Revive us again. We need to ask God to rekindle some of the old fires. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I can remember some revival meetings that I preached in this church where there was people that used to be pews. Well, they still are. I can remember both sides of this place being open. The little sanctuary here was full and both sides full of people. I can remember going to church when I was a little boy at Waterloo Baptist Church. And back then, our old church building had windows that you could raise. And on Sunday evening, listen, on Sunday evening, windows was raised and people standing outside the building listening through the window because they couldn't get into the church because the church was packed out. But you see, it's not happening anymore, is it? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. We all remember those better days. But you see, yesterday's gone. There's not one thing we can do to bring it back. Not one. But the thing that we can do is pick ourselves up and make a difference in our world today. Now, as I bring this thing to a close this morning, in verse 7, it talks about mercy and salvation. 
you can see the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Genesis to the book of Malachi if you look for him. Amen. You see, the psalmist was looking forward to the day that mercy and salvation would come. And mercy and salvation is only found in one individual. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. This psalmist, whoever he is, unknown writer, said something about mercy and salvation in verse 7. He was looking forward to the coming of the God of mercy and grace who would die on an old rugged cross making himself the way, the truth, and the life for all of our salvation. And friend, while you and I look back to that cross, this generation that we're preaching from this morning look forward to that cross. Somebody said, preacher, you can't find grace in the Old Testament. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know what that grace was? That grace was Jesus. You see, he was looking forward. That ark, that ark that he, that ark of safety that he rode on was a type of Jesus Christ, who saves us all. And you see, I wish that I could tell you, Pine Grove, that boy, I'm going to preach this week and I'm going to bring revival. But you know what? I can't bring revival. I can preach to you as God anoints me to speak and to preach. But you see, only God can bring revival. This will be no more than just a series of meetings that we call a revival if God doesn't bring the revival. Just as this writer was looking for, for grace and mercy and salvation, you may be here this morning and you may see yourself in some of what you've heard. <laughs> well, there's a place to get right with God. Sometimes we just need to do business at an altar of prayer. You may be here today and you may need to experience that mercy and that salvation that this psalmist is talking about. In just a moment, Brother Gerald is going to come and he as your pastor is going to stand before you. And if you need to do business with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I want to invite you to put your hand in his hand. He'll pray with you. If you need to be saved by the grace of God and experience the mercy of God, friends, I want you to come and put your hand in his hand. He'll teach you. He'll show you what you need to do. And my goodness, if we have a major uprising and so many come, I'll even come down off the podium. And I'll pray with you and I'll do my best to help my brother. There are deacons here. There are other uh, spirit-filled children of God here that will pray with you. Uh, and help you. My goodness, you may be a deacon and need to come pray. I've been a pastor and a preacher and had to do business with the Lord at an altar of prayer. Don't be ashamed to do business with the King of Kings. He wasn't ashamed to die for you freely and openly. Don't you be ashamed to do business with him today. Stand with me if you will. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. And now that we know a little bit more about what true Holy Ghost sent revival is all about, help us to seek it with all that is within us. And Father, help us as your people turn from our wicked ways so that you can heal our land. Lord, awaken, O oh Lord, each one of us that, God, you may make a difference in our life and in your world. And, Lord, we'll give you thanks for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Gerald, if you'll come. True revival. God speaking to your heart. You step out. You come. You draw a circle on the floor. You put yourself in that circle. That's where the revival is going to come. Yes.